In this video in our How to Again series, we will discuss EMI mitigation techniques for consideration when designing switching converter systems using EGAN FETs and ICs, including passive components. We will start with an overview of an EMI system. Next, we will discuss the effects of specific design choices on EMI generation and propagation, such as layout, rise fall times, and reverse recovery. Lastly, our friends from Worth Electronic will present the impact of inductor choice and placement on EMI propagation and mitigation. An EMI system comprises several components. First is the energy source, which can originate in various forms, for example, as a switching event of a transistor. Energy from the source needs a transmission path, such as conductors on a PCB. These transmission paths can form plates of a capacitor where the voltage can radiate as an E field or in loops where the current can radiate as a H field. It is further possible for a loop to radiate an E field and vice versa for the capacitor plates to radiate H fields. Regardless of transmission means and path, the EMI energy must be received. In the case of direct transmission, it is termed conducted EMI, and in the case of fields, it is termed radiation. The final component in an EMI system is the receiver which by definition is a circuit that becomes corrupted, leading to undesirable behavior. The receiver circuit can be the same circuit that includes the source or a third-party circuit, for example, a radio receiver. In the case of third-party receiver circuits, the prevention of EMI-induced undesirable behavior is governed by EMI standards. Addressing EMI mitigation measures for compliance and corruption prevention inevitably adds cost to a system, and the closer to and including the source that the measures are employed, the lower the cost to the system they become. Here we look at layout as a zero-cost adder EMI mitigation measure. When designing converters, the layout will inherently have parasitic conductance. In this synchronous buck converter example, we show the effect of the loop inductance on the voltage overshoot of the switch node following a rising edge hard switching transition. The left image with loop inductance of 1 nanohenry results in a 70% peak voltage overshoot with ringing. The right image with loop inductance of 400 picohenry results in a 30% peak voltage overshoot with ringing. The EMI generated is proportional to the square of the voltage overshoot magnitude and typically propagates as an E-field emanating from the conductors that form capacitors with earth. The loop inductance will also conduct a current during the ringing period with corresponding EMI generated that is proportional to the square of the current magnitude which typically propagates as a H-field emanating from the power loop circuit. Reducing the power loop inductance by half will reduce the EMI generated by a factor of 4. GAN FETs switch faster than MOSFETs, and many ask the question how this affects EMI. It is important to note that there is fundamentally no change in EMI energy simply because one device switches faster than the other. There is only a shift in spectral content. This can be shown by using an example of a buck converter operating at 1 MHz converting a 48 volt input voltage to 12 volt for two switching transient conditions of 5 nanoseconds and 1 nanosecond respectively. The graph shows the spectrum of the switch node voltage for both transient conditions with rising edge time set the same as the falling edge time and excludes voltage overshoot and ringing. It can be seen on the graph that at 90 MHz, the spectral content has already attenuated by 42 dB. In the 5 nanosecond transient case, the first frequency of node is 200 MHz, or 1 over 5 nanoseconds. And in the 1 nanosecond transient case, the first frequency of node is 1 GHz, or 1 over 1 nanosecond. The rate of decrease in spectral magnitude above these frequencies 
is 40 dB per decade, which means that filtering requirements have already achieved very low levels to begin with, making it more important to address voltage overshoot ringing discussed earlier. The switch node effectively forms the plate of a capacitor, with the earth being the second plate making this form of EMI E-field radiant dominant. Here we present the often overlooked impact of reverse recovery on EMI using a hard switching buck converter as an example. Reverse recovery manifests as a shoot through current in the power loop and as was shown earlier, a current in the power loop leads to voltage overshoot and ringing. The reverse recovery adds to the energy in the power loop and thus adds energy to the EMI source that is proportional to the square of the reverse recovery current. This reverse recovery current can be several times higher in magnitude than the inductor current of the buck converter. The left waveform shows the voltage overshoot and ringing for a MOSFET based buck converter with dead times of 5 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds and 40 nanoseconds respectively and the EGAN FET equivalent on the right waveform under the same operating conditions. It can be seen on the right waveform that a change in dead time has no effect on the GAN FET because it has zero reverse recovery. In summary, EGAN FETs and ICs are EMI compatible. By adopting simple layout techniques, one can ensure significant reduction in EMI generation that adds zero cost to EMI mitigation. The higher switching slew rates only result in a shift in spectral content but do not increase EMI energy. At higher frequencies, EMI reduction techniques are more effective ensuring lower cost to implement. Finally, EGAN FETs and ICs have zero reverse recovery and thus inherently generate less EMI energy in hard switching converters. In the next slides, we will hear from our friends at Worth Electronic who will present the impact of inductor selection and design that ensure lowest EMI generation and propagation. Now, let's talk a little more about magnetic components. As stated earlier, it is critical to address directly the noise source. In a switch mode power supply, the most common noise source is the switch, who by nature creates a high DVDT. Now, if we're not careful, this original spike and its harmonics can propagate to the rest of the circuit through our layout and even radiate by the mean of other components, such as the power inductor. We'll focus on this particular component in a second. The most basic and also the most efficient way to address the switch noise is to place your magnetic components, whether it's the input filter or the output LC circuit, as close as possible to it. By doing so, you'll limit the noise propagation, radiation, even coupling. Let's move on to the inductor itself now. When it comes to inductors, we often want to think that a given material will give you a better EMI performance. This is actually not true. All magnetic materials provide a much easier path to the magnetic field compared to the air. This is not where the difference is made. What is often obvious, though, is the importance of the inductor construction and its EMI performance. The three inductors above are all considered shielded, but they are not equal. There are three things you should actually watch when you're considering an inductor for its EMI properties. Open winding, the pads, and the production process. Now let's review the parts that we have here. On the left inductor, we can clearly see some of the winding. Because of this opening, some of the magnetic field will be allowed to leak out. Also, the pads are visible from the side of the part and will also allow some noise propagation. Now if you look at the middle inductor, the open winding is underneath the part, and this is something you might want to consider when you're doing your layout. Just like the first one, the pads are also visible from the side and will also allow some noise propagation. Now on the right side inductor, you cannot see any winding. And this is because the part has been entirely overmolded. Also, the pads are located underneath the part, which limits any radiation coming up from it. Now, based on these examples, we might be tempted to say that iron-based magnetic have better EMI performance. And this is partially true. A lot of modern iron-based inductors are overmolded and have very good EMI properties. But some of them are not overmolded. Therefore, it's wiser to refer to the production technique instead of the core material. On this slide, we are showing again 
three different inductor constructions, but this time we're looking at the magnetic field path and cross pattern through the PCB. For inductors with vertical winding constructions, we can clearly see the magnetic field going in the PCB through the edges and looping back through the center. For inductors with horizontal winding construction, the field goes through the PCB on one side, then we have some kind of parallel field underneath the part, and it loops back on the other side. The magnetic path is something to consider when you place your vias, ground planes, and other components around the switching area in order to achieve the best possible EMI performance. Another important feature to look after when treating with EMI is the inductor orientation. Indeed, by nature, inductors are not symmetric and windings have to start and end somewhere. The good news is we can use this unbalance to our advantage by orienting the starter winding towards the noise source. But why is this effective? Let's first have a look at the multiple layer inductors. The winding starts at the bottom left and clamps its way up to the top of the part. Now the second layer goes down, overlapping the first layer and finishes at the bottom right corner. Now this overlapping effectively prevents the noise coming into the first layer to be radiated outside of the inductor. This principle is well known in transformer design, but it also applies to inductors. The single layer inductors will also see a similar advantage, but for different reasons. The winding starts at the bottom left corner and clamps its way up to the top of the part. Then, in place of a second layer, the wire simply finishes the winding by a more or less straight shot at the bottom right corner. Now, this straight section is basically an antenna, and you don't want to let this antenna face the switch node, otherwise it's likely to radiate some noise in the air. You can find the starter winding on the top face of more LED inductor. It's either a painting mark or a dent on the surface. The starter winding on the right is usually not indicated as it can be deduced visually. The last property we're going to talk about today is the inductor impedance. The impedance curve of a magnetic component is directly linked to its core material complex permeability. Now we're not going into the details of it, but the complex permeability has two components. A real component, XL, who represents the losses of a part, and an imaginary component, XC, who represents the pure inductive part. Now the result of this is the ghost-like curve represented on this slide. Here we can distinguish the different behavior of the inductor at different frequencies. At lower frequencies, we'll see a behavior close to a lossless inductance. At medium frequency, magnetic components display most of their losses and behave like a resistor. And at high frequency, we'll see magnetic start to behave as capacitor. Frequency on the maximum impedance point is called the self resonant frequency, or SRF. It is a good marker of the inductor behavior with frequency and is always provided by manufacturers in the data sheets. For your switch mode power supply design, a good rule of thumb is to select an inductor with a SRF at least 10 times higher than the switching frequency. In this video, we presented an overview of an EMI system starting from the source and how the energy propagates to where it is eventually received, leading to unwanted behavior. We discussed the effects of specific design choices on EMI generation such as layout, rise fall times, and reverse recovery. Then we heard from our friends at Worth Electronic on the choices of inductors and impact of placement on EMI propagation and mitigation. For more information on inductor design and selection, contact Worth Electronic at wwwwe online.com. For more detailed information about EGAN FETs and ICs, please see the third edition textbook, GAN Transistors for Efficient Power Conversion, or view more videos in the How to GAN series. For more information on EGAN FETs and IC products and evaluation kits, go to www.epc-co.com.